So, yeah, um, although I find mesothelioma much easier to treat, believe it or not, uh, than uh, some of these uh, bizarre mutations that we may find, uh, the, the rare ones. So I'm going to focus on five mutations, although one of them is not so rare, KRAS, HER2, BRAF, MET, and, and TRAC. Um, so we all know targeted therapy of non-small cell lung cancer is uh, an important part of the treatment. Molecular profiling has really become uh, a valuable tool to identify driver mutations that we know are associated with oncogenesis. Um, most of these uh, are re uh, most of these mutations involve proteins that are uh, tyrosine kinases, and that we can uh, use these as rational targets for therapy using tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, and we, as, uh, as Ronnie just told us, uh, initial therapy with uh, uh, targeted therapy for ALK mutations and, and UGFR mutated lung cancers uh, is better than chemotherapy. Um, not so sure yet in these other uh, less common mutations. So this is a figure we've seen before, the evolution of uh, lung cancer classification over the years. Um, when I started training, um, it still was one disease and we treated everybody the same, but uh, obviously that's changed so much over the years with uh, not only histologic subtyping, but now molecular profiling. Um, as you see in the pie chart, the, the most uh, common mutation that we see in um, in adenocarcinomas is KRAS, and yet we don't talk about it much because uh, uh, we don't yet know how to treat it. Um, EGFR and ALK uh, commonly seen, but the, a number of other mutations less common, uh, but uh, may be equally important in, uh, in therapeutic uh, management of these patients. So let's talk about KRAS as the first one. Uh, KRAS is a member of the RAS family of, uh, of oncoproteins, uh, oncogenes, I should say. These are, it's a membrane-bound intracellular GTPase. Uh, it's a central mediator of MAP kinase signaling as well as the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway. Um, oncogenic mutations have been uh, described in uh, codons 12, 13, and 61, and those induce a constitutive, constitutive activation of the RAS uh, signaling. Um, as I said, it's actually the most common mutation that we see in adenocarcinomas. Uh, about uh, 20 to 25 percent of non-small cell lung cancers will have this mutation uh, and uh, is often associated with smoking. Uh, it may be associated with a worse prognosis, although more recent data suggests that may, that may be a little overblown. It may, may be uh, not uh, so much. Um, but definitely is associated with resistance to EGFR TKIs, probably because it's a mutually exclusive mutation uh, for the most part uh, with EGFR mutations. Um, interestingly, uh, it may actually sensitize uh, patients to the use of pemetrexid uh, or anti antifolates uh, through upregulation of microRNA that will downregulate, well, pemetrexid upregulates microRNA that may downregulate KRAS signaling. So it's a kind of interesting idea. Um, so the initial targeted therapies looking at KRAS function really were focusing on the inhibition of, of uh, translocation of this to, uh, protein to the membrane using farnesyl transferase inhibitors. Um, the initial uh, studies with these agents uh, were disappointing, phase two trial of a, of a uh, license plate uh, 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 compound there uh, showed no responses. Although um, the the in that initial study, KRAS uh, wasn't defined as uh, in in those uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients. And it, more in a more salient feature, I guess, in the next trial, all all KRAS uh, positive patients uh, uh, using this phase two trial of uh, salaracib, uh, farnesyl transferase inhibitor, again showed no objective responses. So. Probably not the, the way to go, uh, at least uh, uh, with those compounds. But as we said, KRAS does cause downstream signaling. Um, and so that's the other pathways uh, are, are ripe for picking. Um, looking at uh, MEC, for example. So there's a randomized phase two trial of docetaxel with, the, with or without the MEC inhibitor, sulametinib. And this study uh, did show uh, a, uh, what looked promising with a progression-free survival uh, uh, benefit, uh, but uh, unfortunately did not turn out to be an overall survival benefit and on the graph on the right. Um, it, it, there, you know, numerically looks improved and hazard ratio was actually 0 0.8, but statistically uh, was uh, not, uh, uh, not to be the case with a p-value of 0.21. Uh, single agent therapy with uh, a, a MEK inhibitor uh, was also, has also been evaluated, trametinib uh, versus uh, docetaxel in a randomized phase two trial. Uh, again, looking at this study, uh, overall response rates were, were low, actually uh, significantly low in both arms, uh, only 12% response, and no difference really between uh, single agent trametinib or single agent docetaxel. Um, 
So not only does the MAP kinase pathway be activ as activated with KRAS, but also the mTOR, uh, P3 kinase mTOR pathway as well. So this was an interesting trial uh, looking at an mTOR inhibitor, uh, right of uh, It was a discontinuation trial, uh, about, about 80 patients. All the patients received eight weeks of the uh, mTOR inhibitor. And then they were randomized to either uh, continue on the drug or uh, on placebo. In this discontinuation study, there was a, um, what looked at least numerically to be uh, some improvement in median overall survival uh, in these patients who were able to continue on uh, the drug. Um, unfortunately, there hasn't been much more done with this compound, and I think it's sort of changed hands among different companies, and right now it doesn't appear to be it's, that it's going forward. Um, but uh, it does, you know, at least raise the idea of using mTOR uh, uh, inhibition as a possible treatment pathway for KRAS disease. If you look at the preclinical data, um, it also looks like combination therapy with a MEK inhibitor and an mTOR inhibitor may have some additive effect in KRAS uh, mutant uh, cell lines. So if you look at the, the uh, KRAS wild type population, when you uh, try to you use a uh, um, mTOR inhibitor, uh, there is some uh, decrease in, in, uh, in cell growth, uh, not much with just a, a MEK inhibitor alone. And then combination in the wild type doesn't seem to be any different than just mTOR by itself. But in the KRAS mutant patient or, uh, cell population, uh, you can see that there seems to be additive effects when you add a uh, MEK inhibitor, mTOR inhibitor, and then the both, uh, uh, both agents in the far right uh, column. So it is a, maybe, there may be a potential role for dual inhibition of MAP kinase in the PI3 kinase pathways. So where are we now? Well, the current standard of care is still just uh, chemotherapy or immunotherapy, uh, same as KRAS wild type. But there's multiple trials. I mean, you could, I, I didn't have room on the slide to list them all. There's, there's probably a dozen or more looking at um, different combinations. So the, again, the MEK inhibitor with an mTOR inhibitor combination, I think is uh, really interesting. Uh, Palaciclib, a, a CDK4-6 inhibitor, along with MEK inhibitor and, and other combinations. So I think there's uh, more to come in this uh, field. Obviously having 20 or 25% of patients having this mutation, uh, I think it's an important uh, potential driver that we should be uh, focusing on and hopefully we'll have some more information in the future. All right, let's move on. So HER2. Well, HER2 is some, uh, obviously a, a, a protein we know a lot about in, in the world of breast cancer and GI cancers now as well. Um, it's a member of the HER family of proteins. You know, EGFR is HER1. This is HER2. It's a receptor tyrosine kinase, and it also stimulates signaling through the MAP kinase and PI3 kinase pathways. Um, oncogenic mutations in lung cancer uh, are uh, usually an in-frame exon 20 insertion. And this causes constitutive activation of the, uh, the tyrosine kinase activity. Um, again, it's one of the rare mutations found in about 2 to 4% of non-small cell lung cancers. And it's also more prevalent in uh, never smokers. Now, interestingly, there's not an association between HER2 amplification and expression with that mutation. And we've seen in other studies that, that uh, trastuzumab, an antibody to HER2, doesn't really have any benefit in uh, HER2 amplified non-small cell lung cancer. So it's not as simple uh, as it is in uh, breast cancer. Not to say that breast cancer is simple. Um, but there are some uh, targeted therapies that uh, we, can, we can consider now. Trastuzumab is that monoclonal antibody against HER2. In breast cancer, it works by HER2 internalization and degradation. It actually has uh, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity as well as inhibition of, of the HER2 function, uh, inhibition of dimerization activation of HER2. Now, there's very limited data in trastuzumab with uh, exon 20 insertion HER2. Um, there is a retrospective study that was uh, presented uh, uh, that uh, about 15 patients, which showed a disease control rate of uh, about 96%. And so that's really most of the data that we have for trastuzumab um, in lung cancer. Uh, so it, it certainly looks um, like there could be some potential there. Um, we'll have to wait and see. Now, a fat nib, as we talked about a lot today already, is a pan-HER inhibitor. So it not only hits, inhibits HER1, EGFR, it also inhibits HER2, uh, and it was the irreversible uh, activity. Uh, so there is, again, limited data in, in HER2 exon 20 insertion non-small cell lung cancer. In the waterfall plot on the left, um, I want to focus your attention on the green bars, if you can 
maybe hard to tell, it was only seven patients. This was a, a number of different cohorts, but the non-small cell lung cancer is the green bars. Um, what's interesting, it's only seven patients, but five of these patients had, a, a, they're all below the bar, uh, you know, as far as uh, response, so at least having some benefit. One of them was an unconfirmed PR. Um, so it, again, suggests that there may be some activity of uh, a fat nib in these HER2 exon 20 insertion uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients. So where are we now with HER2 di uh, disease? Uh, so for HER2, uh, for HER2 mutated uh, exon 20 insertion, um, that's an important part, um, and non-small cell lung cancer, it's reasonable to consider a HER2-directed therapy after progression on chemotherapy. A FATNIB is listed uh, in the NCCN guidelines with a Category 2B recommendation, as is trastuzumab. Now, there's a lot of other trials looking at uh, HER2 uh, inhibitors, naratinib, decamitinib, as well as uh, uh, TDM1 uh, uh, for uh, this patient population. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a rare mutation. It's hard to do large studies, but hopefully we'll have some more information uh, in the future for this. All right, moving on, BRAF. Uh, so it's sort of a theme here. <laughs> BRAF is, a, is a, a mediator, a downstream mediator of KRAS signaling. Um, and again, it's one of the key components of that MAP kinase pathway. Um, oncogenic mutations have been well described in, in uh, other, other tumor types. Uh, the V600 uh, mutation um, is the uh, most uh, uh, common that we see. Um, it's uh, the V600E would be the most one, common one of those. And this is a commonly seen uh, in light smokers and never smokers. There are non-V600 mutations in BRAF uh, that are uh, seen in, uh, more commonly in smokers. Again, these mutations cause a, a constitutive activation of the BRAS kinase activity and downstream signaling. And this is, again, rare mutation found in 1 to 3 percent of non-small cell lung cancers. Uh, perhaps uh, the non-V600 uh, mutations may have a worse prognosis overall, and um, the BRAF mutations may be a mediator of resistance in uh, EGFR mutated uh, cancers as well. So we have good BRAF inhibitors. There, BRAF V600E mutation is commonly seen in melanoma, and so there's um, a number of uh, BRAF inhibitors that are now commercially available. Um, so this was a, a, a non-small cell lung cancer cohort of a, uh, of a BRAF V600 mutated uh, uh, patients receiving vemurafenib. Uh, as you can see in this waterfall plot, the um, majority of these patients did have uh, some uh, shrinkage of their tumors. Overall response rate in, this, uh, in these 19 patients or 20 patients was uh, 42%. Uh, so that looks, uh, again, looks like a, a promising uh, uh, activity. Um, the, another BRAF inhibitor, dabrafenib, uh, also FDA approved for melanoma, for V600E mutated melanoma, has uh, been investigated in a larger phase two trial in uh, the BRAF V600E non-small cell lung cancer. And this showed, again, the waterfall plot you can see, significant patients uh, had, uh, most, maybe two-thirds of the patients had some uh, degree of tumor shrinkage. Overall response rate by resist was 33 percent. Again, that's very encouraging and uh, with a manageable toxicity uh, profile. Uh, Progression-free survival in, in these patients was only about five and a half months. Um, but I think even more exciting is combination therapy with dabrafenib uh, and trametinib, so a BRAF inhibitor plus a MEK inhibitor. Uh, in, in extrapolation from data in melanoma, the combination therapy with these two agents and BRAF mutated melanoma showed improved responses and survival. And uh, so we've seen, we're seeing something similar here in the BRAF mutated lung cancers. This was a phase two trial, uh, 57 patients with BRAF V600E mutated non-small cell lung cancer, previously treated again. Um, and we see an overall response rate of 63%. Look at that waterfall plot. And it's pretty impressive um, in uh, especially previously treated patients two patients with a complete response uh, that was confirmed. Uh, so then this had a, a progression-free survival of about nine months and manageable toxicities. Interestingly, when you combine dabrafenib and trametinib together, the toxicities are actually less than dabrafenib alone. Um, so it's, uh, at least from the melanoma data. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, it's, uh, it, this looks like a, a, a very uh, uh, promising combination uh, in the, to be evaluated in further studies. 
All right, so where are we? Standard of care now for BRAF mutations. The current standard of care is to consider a BRAF inhibitor uh, therapy after chemotherapy, uh, either vimurafenib alone, dibrafenib alone, or dibrafenib and trametinib. And those all are listed in NCCN guidelines with a category 2A recommendation. Um, there's ongoing clinical trials with dibrafenib and trametinib. I think probably we're going to see some trials of vimurafenib and cobimetinib uh, now as well. You know, it's uh, sort of pick your, uh, pick your inhibitor. And uh, so at, for a rare disease, at least uh, I think uh, for the rare mutations, it looks like there's uh, some valuable uh, responses there. All right. MET. So MET mutations. Um, so MET is a membrane-bound, again, receptor tyrosine kinase. It's the receptor for hepatocyte growth factor. Um, the common MET uh, mutations that are seen are amplification mutations and causing overexpression, seen about 6% of patients with non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinomas, um, and uh, also the exon 14 skipping mutation, 3 to 4%. These mutations may be smoking related, and there are some targeted therapies, uh, monoclonal antibodies as well as small molecule inhibitors uh, that can target the, the kinase activity of MET. So the large phase three trial that was done a few years ago, the MET, -MAB, uh, or MET lung trial using onertuzumab, uh, about 500 patients uh, uh, was a, uh, you know, a, a valiant effort in looking at, at, at uh, using a MET antibody uh, to, uh, to target uh, this patient population. It was a combination of erlotinib with or without onertuzumab, and these were all previously treated uh, patients uh, that were uh, MET positive by IHC. Unfortunately, the study showed that there was no benefit in overall survival or progression-free survival, and even in the subgroup analysis, uh, there was no uh, benefit. Hazard ratio was actually greater than one uh, in this uh, in this study, so that one was a bust. Um, but uh, the Marquis trial uh, was an even larger study, a thousand patients, a thousand plus patients using the MET inhibitor tavantinib. Again, looking at erlotinib with or without tavantinib in previously treated non-small cell lung cancer. And these patients were stratified by EGFR, KRAS, and smoking status. The interim data showed some improved PFS, but unfortunately, the primary endpoint. Again, looking at this graph, showed no benefit in overall survival. Um, and this study was discontinued in 2012 for futility. But on subgroup analysis, there, it did, even though there was no benefit overall, and PFS and, and, but PFS and overall response rate were a little better, and tavantinib did improve overall survival in the MET high population, the subgroup. So maybe that in a biomarker selected population, there may be some role uh, for uh, uh, tavantinib um, uh, remains to be seen. I don't think they're moving forward with that drug, actually. <laughs> and so, uh, but there are other tyrosine kinase inhibitors, of course, that have activity against MET. And crizotinib, we're all very f familiar with and comfortable with. It, it inhibits uh, not only ALK and ROS1, but it inhibits a MET inhibitor. So the phase one um, experience uh, so far with MET-amplified non-small cell lung cancer has shown some evidence of efficacy, especially in the intermediate and high MET amplification patients. Uh, and there's uh, the figures on the, uh, the middle and the right side showing uh, in that water fall plot showing some uh, significant responses in those uh, populations of uh, patients. Um, another, uh, a larger uh, experience here with MET amplified non-small cell lung cancer in this waterfall plot, uh, again, showing um, uh, about half the patients having some shrinkage of their tumors with, uh, with treatment uh, with, with crizotinib. Interestingly, this study did not show a correlation between copy number and response. Um, the, the yellow bars are the percent change in tumor volume, um, and uh, the pink bars on top are progression-free survival. So I think it's, uh, you can probably infer that those patients who uh, had some response were more likely to have some benefit from progression-free survival, although if you compare it to the, those bars on the left where there was, uh, in a, there was no response, the, the progression-free survival obviously was very short. So I think that, uh, you know, this does look like it, it could be uh, something promising. Um, in another um, uh, study of crizotinib, this time instead of MET amplified patients, these were in MET exon 14 skipping mutation patients, uh, 16 patients, all of whom had some degree of disease control, a confirmed PR in half of the patients, uh, but a 100% disease control rate in this initial experience. This was just presented at ASCO. So crizotinib may be a, a potential um, drug uh, for this patient population going forward. Cabozantinib also has activity against MET, and this was a, a case report looking at uh, 
a patient with a uh, MET exon 14 skipping mutation, uh, the PET scan on the left baseline, and after one month of cabozantinib, uh, obviously had a significant response on, on PET uh, CT. So uh, perhaps uh, cabozantinib may be a, a, an option as well. So the current standard of care uh, for patients who have had uh, progression on chemotherapy with a MET, and they have MET amplified or a MET exon 14 mutation, I would consider crizotinib, and that's listed as a category 2A recommendation by NCCN. Other clinical trials are looking at cabozantinib and then some other investigational agents as well. All right, I'm running short on time, but the last section, NTRAC. So I got to tell you, I didn't know much about NTRAC when I was asked to do this section, so it was really interesting. This, this TRAC mutation, the TRAC family of genes, has been around for a long time as far as knowing that they're oncogenic since the 1980s. Um, but more recently, it's been discovered that NTRAC fusions uh, are play an important role in oncogenesis. It's found across multiple malignancies, not just lung cancer. Uh, NTRAC, there's three NTRAC proteins. NTRAC1 is the uh, uh, NTRAC1, I, said, in, I should say three NTRAC genes. NTRAC1 gene uh, fusions are more common in non-small cell lung cancer. And this uh, results in a fusion with the TRAC kinase domain uh, with a, another element. And there's, a, there's several different partners, five prime partners that have been described, um, and resulting in constitutive activation of the, ty of the tyrosine kinase activity. This is, again, found in 3% of non-small cell lung cancer, so not, not trivial, um, and seen in smokers and non-smokers. And now there are track inhibitors that are in development that are potentially effective. So here's a, uh, not a lung cancer, but a soft tissue sarcoma uh, that, is, that harbors a NTRAC1 fusion. And there's a, uh, this uh, track inhibitor, LOXO-101, uh, which uh, is uh, being evaluated and being uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the clinics now, showing a remarkable response that was just uh, shown in, in, a, in a case report. Uh, but also in lung cancer, we're seeing uh, responses to track inhibitors as well. So here's another case report of a patient with an NTRAC1 rearranged non-small cell lung cancer looking at uh, uh, using uh, intrectinib, a uh, NTRAC inhibitor. Um, and uh, seeing response not only uh, in the chest, but also in the brain. It's hard to see that, that on the baseline there's two brain mets, both of which uh, disappear by day 26 and stay, uh, are still away by day 155. Uh, so intract mutations, I think we're going to see more on this. Uh, there are no commercially available intract inhibitors currently, but multiple trials um, are available uh, for patients around the country. Uh, cabozantinib does have some activity against uh, a track. Uh, Intrac 1, and then there's other uh, inhibitors that are currently in development, some of which don't have a name yet. So the whole goal of this therapy, again, is to identify patients from uh, this big group of non-small cell lung cancer, divide them into the different patient populations that we can treat more effectively, um, and I think we're making progress in that regard. Thank you.